Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for coming back uh, to another exciting episode of the Music History Project. Today, we have another very special guest, Dan Sun Seth. Welcome to the Music History Project. We're your hosts. I'm Mike Mullins. Dan Del Fiorentino. And Michelle Shudler. All of our content comes from the Oral History Program, which is sponsored by NAM, the National Association of Music Merchants. And that is a collection that is over 3,500 interviews and constantly growing. If you want to check out any of our content or any of our other interviews that aren't featured today, please check out our website at www.nam.org library. Well, welcome back, everybody. This is a very exciting podcast as uh, my son, Seth, is here. Seth, welcome. Thank you. I'm really excited. I've always wanted to do a podcast, especially about my experiences. So I'm very happy. To awesome. Be here. Very cool. Very, very cool. So what we thought we would do today, since poor Seth has been dragged to interviews since he was a little kid, um, some of them he remembers, and uh, we thought it would be really awesome to ask him to talk about some of his favorite experiences, some of his favorite memories, and some of the interesting people that he's met along the way. I do believe my first memory of taking Seth to a interview was when he was about two and a half years old. And afterwards, since he was so quiet during the interview, we went to Dairy Queen. That I remember. (laughs) I think he's been hooked on it ever since. (laughs) So we're going to start off with um, a very special interview. Tell me a little bit about uh, the first one we're going to hear. I honestly, I don't think I was there for the interview with Larry Dunn, but the only like major thing that we know about him is his drink that we called the Larry Dunn, where it's a mix between like sparkling water and then like um, some kind of juice. And it honestly, like if you think about like, oh, it's nothing, right? It's just a drink. But when you actually taste it, it's magical. It, honestly <laughs> is. It, it instantly quenches your thirst and it just... I don't know. It just gets you in the mood for music, I guess. And it just, <laughs> it just a, like, it's just really delightful. And it, and like, even though I only really know him for the drink, I'm sure he's a great guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, he was also part of that thing called Earth, Wind, and Fire. <laughs> but besides that, in our house, he was known as Larry Dunn, the guy who invented the drink. And uh, I I do believe that after the interview was over, he poured us a a glass of this and I was so excited to share it with uh, Seth when I got home um, that we call it the Larry Dunn. So we, st- I still have a Larry Dunn every once in a while. <laughs> yeah, me too. I remember just going to the store, just looking for the ingredients. Like, oh, I just got to find the juice. I got to make this Larry Dunn. <laughs> so here is a web clip from Larry Dunn's interview for the NAM Oral History Program. That day we were at uh, Manual High School uh, and we were, uh, we were opening the show for the group War. And uh, like my mom, you say, Larry, you're so honorary. So I went up to, uh, you know, Lonnie Jordan's uh, roadie, little cat, and I said, you know, well, what kind of guy is Lonnie, man? Oh, Lonnie, he's a great guy, but he's the baddest B three player in the world. I'm like, yeah, okay, I mean, I know he's good, but I, mean, I grew up on Jimmy Smith and so, but in the world, so I got up and then we were playing. And Sammy's like, you got it. So I took like about a eight minute B three solo and played from jazz to baroque or just different stuff. Philip happened to be back in Denver just to hang out for a minute. He went right to the phone. There was no cell towers then. There was no cell phones. He put a bunch of coins in, and he called Maurice and he told me, hey, I think I think we got the guy. Said you know he can. He's, he can really play. Doesn't have a lot of experience, but he can really play, and he's a nice guy. And I told Philip Larry, I said, don't be telling people I don't have a lot of experience. I was playing nightclubs when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> and so I took that Rhodes that I had, and uh, I learned all of the, the material from the first two Warner Brothers albums by ear. Oh, I, I, I did take classical in the third and fourth grade. But I learned all this by ear and then flew out. Verdeen picked me up, almost got us killed going on the wrong lane on, on uh, Century Boulevard. 
oncoming traffic. He was mad at them. God bless you, Dean. Um, we went up to Maurice and his house. We whipped out the piano, played a couple of Earth, Wind & Fire songs, and I broke into a little bit of uh, Herbie Hancock, Maiden Voyage. And uh, as they say, the rest was history. Wow. 17. And I think I had just turned 18, Juneteenth, June 19th, mm. my birthday, yeah. Mm. That's crazy. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a, you know, it's like I tell people, it's a, with men impossible, with God all things are possible. We do special things to help them learn mm. and, and, and do workshops and things that, uh, that would help. And so we loved it. We loved selling organs. And we... We did one down in the south in um, Georgia. Anyway, and this fella, they had dumped a whole bunch of organs on him uh, that were, they were coming up with a new model, and he didn't know how he'd sell them. And they had a special program developed that they could do. So um, I looked at it, and I said, uh, Honey, could I do that tonight? And I just do it. He said, yeah, why don't you? So I did. And they sold all their organs. And I had a picture of him later on with him looking down at me. And, and, and it said, uh, he asked Eddie, he said, you asked me, how, no, ask me, how much commitment do you have to this guy? <laughs> and I said, oh, I don't know, about 40-some years or something, you know. And because he said, I never had anything go like that. We were with Yamaha for about eight years. And that was supposedly our retirement years, you know. <laughs> and when everybody else was playing shuffleboard or something like that, <laughs> we were traveling and didn't have to cut into our savings because we could go all of these wonderful places. We did uh, the Caribbean cruises and cruise to Hawaii and to Alaska and all of these things got paid for it by the company. <laughs> they put the, the instruments on board and we could uh, do concerts and workshops when the ship was at sea. And then we would um, just uh, be tourists when the ship was in port. So here we were doing the things that people were using their savings for. And we were getting paid for. <laughs> and doing the thing we loved, doing it together. So I can't imagine a more wonderful life this has been. I have really been under, <laughs> under a lucky star, I think. <laughs> so once again, that was Larry Dunn that you heard first, and then we heard a new voice. Um, that was Marty Baxter. So what can you guys tell us about her and your experience with that interview? I remember being with her. She's just a cute old lady. There's a lot I remember her. <laughs> she's just being this cute old lady, and she was just very um, nice. And I remember that she, so she gave me this book. I actually have it here I brought. Mm. And um, it's just about just fun things. She was very fun, and that's shown in her book. It's not serious at all it's poems puns and parodies that's what it's called <laughs> and, and she actually dedicated it to me on the i'm gonna read this it says to seth you do a terrific job and she's referring to i help set up like when i, I don't interview when i help i don't really interview all i do is just sit there listen and set up that's all i do i know but that's very important by the way <laughs> I, I was good at setting up too, <laughs> <laughs> and listening, and breakdown too. I'm yeah, sure. Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did breakdown too. I, I just remember like setting up all the lights. I was pretty good at the lights. So here we go. Um, it was so great to meet you. Hope you get your laughs out of this, and it just best wishes. So she's she just very nice, and it, it was a fun experience to go with her. And what's interesting to me is she was really the quintessential salesperson. You know, she was always selling something. And of course, during her career, her and her husband had a uh, a music store, and they also went around and toured playing organ and piano in various stores all over the country. So she was very, very good at connecting with people and making people feel comfortable. And that's certainly what she did for us, without a doubt. 
I really love in just the web clip how she talks about well, maybe I'll retire, but why would I when I get to go on cruises all the time <laughs> but get paid to do it? So it was just such a fun, happy interview. Absolutely. Well said. So I think the uh, next person we want to hear from is Brian Justice. And uh, that was an interview that took place outside of Kent in the UK on Seth's very first trip to England. Uh, what do you remember about seeing Mr. Justice? So what I remember is that he, I think he gave me may, maybe like a coin or something, or maybe that was someone else. But I remember that he was just very like a wise old man. That's kind of how I saw him. And I remember one thing, uh, I still kind of feel embarrassed doing it. it he gave me so like these books and then he gave me a drink and I actually spilled the drink all over all his books <laughs> and, but the thing was that like he didn't get mad at all we, uh, we were just like oh crap like what did we do and then he's like oh don't worry about it just an old book so like he was just very like welcoming in that way so I was very happy that he wasn't mad mm. and then his um his wife was very kind too where we we went on a walk while you're doing the interview we were going on a walk <clears throat> and like the net neighborhood but like outside and there was this dog and she's like oh i wish we had a dog like (laughs) that's kind of how she was she was very very sweet can i tell the story about what she said when we walked to the front door so when we first got there she wasn't sure what to expect um and she was a little nervous actually that we were there filming her husband um but she was completely unarmed when Seth was at the front door. She looked at him with the widest eyes and said, a oh boy. <laughs> it was like Peter Pan came to visit her or something. She was so happy. Well, what I learned later is that she had five older brothers Aww. and who she basically raised, even though she was the littlest. So um, she was... Without them, you know, they were all grown. All her children were grown. So to have this child come up to the doorstep was the specialist time that we could possibly have given her. And he totally made her comfortable. I mean, that was one of the magic things about Seth at that particular time that I'll never forget is that she was nervous and it was going to be a little difficult to set up in her home and try to get her to relax as well as her husband. But Seth did all that. All I had to do was set up the gear and they went for a walk. They talked about dogs and trees and things like that and made her happy. And that was that was particularly meaningful. And one thing I remember on that walk was, so at the time I was, I chewed on my shirt a lot. So I had like this little like chew thing. So I would chew on that instead of my shirt. And we were walking and I don't know how it happened, but that thing just flew into the bushes. <laughs> so I... I think it was red and it just like flew into the bushes and then she went and just got and got it for me. So like that was just really nice. It was fun to have like kind of experience with her. Just it was fun. We, we just walked around through the it wasn't like the wilderness, but it kind of seemed like that just for that little part. And then it was just a fun experience while you were doing your work. I was having fun with this old lady. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You know, what's really occurring to me about this is these are such fun behind the scenes stories And we're not really focusing on the amazing careers that these guys had. And that's for them to do. You know, that's that's part of what the interviews are supposed to do for people who listen to them. So with that in mind, let's hear a little bit about Brian Justice and his contributions to the music industry. The East German music instrument industry went back to the 17th century. And many of the names in America were originated in that part of Germany. And the west of Germany, which was developing after the war, was originally all those people in the east. They went west very quickly and they developed their industry in Bubenreuth and places like that. So we developed and worked with um, manufacturers here and we made a contribution by making parts for them and they made a contribution by selling us parts and so the whole thing developed. So... We developed a very strong business in brass, string instruments, because we had historical, old, old quality instruments. Bows, violins, cellos, and we also had a big school instrument business and lots of recorders. 
and so it went on. And then we visited the Frankfurt Fair. We had a stand there. The East Germans had a stand, and they traded under the name of De Musa. Now, De Musa was a, one of those words that the Germans are so good at, which is Deutsche Musik Instrumenten Außenhandel und Spielwaren Gesellschaft, which meant music instruments and toys. And they were the export organization. And we represented the, inter uh, the interest of the music in, in Great Britain and this part of Europe. Mm. At that time, I met Americans who also were in the Frankfurt Fair. And they came to start looking at uh, instruments from East Germany. Because again, the old contacts were there, the names were familiar, and some of the people in the 60s were still alive from before the war and they remember that their father did this and their father did that. If you, uh, St. Louis Music is an example because St. Louis Music, um, they came originally from, I think it was, Lithuania. So it's all part of the European musical instrument industry. So that's how we got involved and that's how I got involved. In a lot of ways, a professional musician is better equipped to deal with an instrument with a fault in than the beginner. You want to give them the best you can possibly do. And that's my, always been my view. It's also why I've spent a lot of time, as well as the industry, as well as the business and growing the business, in education. Because I believe that education, the bottom of the pyramid, is at the root of the success of our industry. And one of the things that I think is also important that the British music industry has achieved that better than most is we've managed to, you know, some of them screaming and kicking, we've dragged all the people in, whether they make amplifiers or, you know, effect pedals and everything, to recognising that music is music. They will all benefit. If there's more music being played, it's up to you to get your share. And that's the big thing. Of course, changes are enormous. I mean, uh, and we've had our ups and downs. I remember 1980, 81, and we lost 15% of our customer base in that time. There was a big recession. It was the worst time that we had. But actually the renewal that happened after that actually strengthened the business. Uh, we've got changes at the moment. We've got a few chains growing again in Britain. It's happened before, and then they've tended to fall down. I think this time is different. And... Uh, you know, there's some very good business bring it, bringing a professionalism into uh, the retailing of musical instruments, which wasn't there before. Mm. There's also, um, we're fortunate in Britain that we have got, um, in general, with much complaint, we've got a very enlightened attitude towards music education. Music education across the board, in fact, we've achieved a lot partly through lobbying ourselves as an industry and getting the right people on our side. We've got a recognition now that every child should be given an opportunity to learn a musical instrument. Of course, we've got a long way to go before it's every child, but we will be probably within three years' time, I would say that one third of children will receive that opportunity. That was Brian Justice, and following him was Michael Dowdy. Um, I really enjoyed both of those interviews. One, like what an original perspective that Brian Justice had on the East Berlin versus West Berlin. Right. And just business during that time was such an amazing story. But near and dear to my own heart is the emphasis that Michael put on education and music education for everyone. Yeah, no doubt about it. I think that's a those are quintessential interviews and both took place on the very same day, as I recall, in, in Kent. What can you remember about uh, Mr. Dowdy, Seth? I think I remember more about his wife than <laughs> him. But I re so he was the one that gave me the coin. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I still have that coin, but I wish I did. And that was just a really fun experience where, like, I got to see another culture because I've always lived in America. But now I got to see kind of a little bit of a culture in England. And I thought that was really important. And it wasn't much different from what I've lived in. But so, for example, like one difference is the toys like we in America have monkeys in a barrel, but they had like Bob in a barrel. So it's like a barrel. You open it. There's like this little boy inside, this little plastic boy. And like if that's the. The number one thing I remember from that. <laughs> 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 
I don't know, but and and his wife, I think, made you a a sandwich. Yeah, it was like a grilled cheese, but like they called it something different, like a toasty, right? Yeah, yeah, something. (laughs) (laughs) They had different ways that they made it too. Mm. So, like, even though this is kind of away from what you know the music thing, but this is kind of just relates to more like the culture difference, and I I thought it was important. Um, And I remember one time I was going through this field with the wife and there was this ball and because like um, her kids have grown up and haven't lived there for years. So uh, the ball was all sun bleached and it was all nasty. And I remember just running up to it, just kicking the ball and it was very deflated. But I had fun fun with that ball. (laughs) I think it's cool that with all of these interviews that you sat in on, we're highlighting not really what the people are known for but kind of like the real person behind that Mm -hmm. and it's i I think it's just such a cool angle to see so you got a perspective that not many other people get like even dan doesn't i mean he talks to them and meets these people but then he's all business with the interview and you kind of get to see the real human side of all these people yeah and i find that's very important Mm -hmm. because like sometimes the work of somebody could be kind of diminished if they're not a good person. Right. So like, I feel that that's really good to kind of see a different side of this. Not, not always just the music side, but like the personality side too. Well said. Yeah. Plus you got to eat their toasties. I know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and cake as we're going to hear later on. Yeah. Food but, is a very big part. But <laughs> first, <laughs> uh, Robert Cray, I think is up next. The, the great bluesman. Um, tell me what you remember about doing that interview. So I remember that I had no idea who this guy was. And I remember, so we were at my grandparents' house and it was like on the newspaper or something that like he was in town and I'm like, okay, just some guy, I guess he's fairly famous, but I never knew, th- I never heard about him in my life. So I got very confused on who this person was <laughs> because, so he was talking about Muddy Waters, who I, who I, in more recent times I've heard and like he's he's great but I'm like okay the guy I interviewed that's Muddy Waters right because he talked about it he must be him I'm like oh wait he died in the 90s I'm like <laughs> that can't be the guy I interviewed <laughs> so I got very confused but um, but you know if if you get me confused on your Muddy Waters you gotta do something right right <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly <laughs> yeah that was done in an old theater in Sacramento and I can't remember that. I want to say Fox Theater, but I'm not quite sure about that. Yeah, but it, it was really neat is that when Seth and I arrived, it was mid-afternoon before sound check. And we had to wait around a little bit, but I think it was worth it because we got to see all the workers come in. We got to be in the theater before anybody else. So it was kind of dark and we kind of got to run and down, up and down the aisles and go behind the concession stand and stuff like that. And I remember his manager came up to us and... Said, he says, okay, is this the crew for the interview? And I said, yes, sir. And because he was an older gentleman. And he says, wow, I didn't know we had such a professional lighting guy. And he looked right at Seth. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty funny. And then, uh, then Robert came out and he was so nice. You know, one of the things I, I want to emphasize is, yeah, okay, on, on the occasion that I had the opportunity to bring my son with me to interviews, he always conducted himself in a professional manner and was always polite and in in retrospect was very, very helpful. And this was another moment where I felt like because Seth was younger and polite and interested in him, he was disarmed and he was like, oh, okay, cool. I get to talk to a kid. And that was really, really neat. And I think his explanation of the blues I think he would have been a little bit more technical and maybe not as interesting, if I can say that, if he was just talking to me. But trying to explain it to Seth, who was listening, I think he had a more real, more passionate way of explaining that it was an expression of your feelings. And I don't think that would have come out the same way had I just been by myself. So that is a a very interesting memory, um, remembrance that I have about that. And when, like, someone tries to explain something to a little kid, it'll be a lot more, like, interesting, a lot more um, understandable than if he's trying to explain it to an adult. So it might reach more to an audience, too, if he's trying to make it more general. Good point. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was exactly the case. So what is uh, Robert going to be talking about in the uh, clip we're about to hear, Michelle? So Robert's going to start talking about his 
his music store adventures, how he kind of acquired his first guitar. Um, he was a part of a military family, so it was just interesting to hear how that has affected him and his passion for music. When we came back from uh, the st- from Europe and we moved uh, again back to Fort Lewis in Washington State to south of Tacoma, uh, and when the Beatles had come out, there was a music shop where I lived in an area called Lakewood, south of Tacoma, a place called Gary Gunter's Bandstand, where they had the Fox amplifiers there that the Beatles used, you know. And... Uh, it was a super beetle, and I and I and, I, and we just as kid kids we'd go to the store. And Richard Cousins, our current bass player, he lived in the same area too, and we talked about this over the years. You know, all the cool gear was at Gary Donner's bandstand. Yeah. So were you like most kids during that time, going in there dreaming of something to buy? Going in there and dreaming, or ordering the, the catalogs. You know, the guitar and amp catalogs. I had them all. You know, and that's that's what we did. It was a, it was it was it was serious passion you know and then all the kids uh, when I got a guitar in the 60s after we came back from Germany when the Beatles hit that's when I got a guitar and uh, and all the kids it seemed like in every carport that you know they had a guitar and they were listening to the radio and then we get together and then we would teach one another what we had learned you know and and that, that's that got everything going I think to be involved in music first of all there's, it's all about love, the love of playing music. It's the love of listening to music. It's the love of sharing music and enjoying it. That's what we do on stage every night. And, uh, and when I listen to a song, it's, I'm, I'm listening for everything. I'm listening for things that aren't even said, you know, things that are implied or maybe not even. There's all different kinds of ways to listen to music. And I, I like and listen to a lot of different kinds of music. Uh, rather than the kind of music that we in particularly play, you know. Uh, and, uh, I mean, you, you can't do it without love. That's what it's all about. I did Bag Full of Soul, then I did an album called Fantastic Feliciano, right. and then um, the album Feliciano came along. That's when I met Rick Girard, who had produced the Jefferson Airplane, and uh, later he produced Harry Nielsen, so um, uh, the Feliciano album really was my first successful album uh, in 1968. That album contained Light My Fire, California Dreamin'. Uh, and so that was my fourth album. Mm. Then, thank God I was on my way. Prior to that, by the way, uh, I started a Latin career in Argentina where I recorded... Uh, the Spanish torch ballads called Boleros, and they took off, and I became a big star in Latin America first. And then in 1968, um, with the windows in Latin America being opened, the windows uh, in America were flung open in 68. I, w- I won two Grammys that year. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah. What guitar did you play on that album? Do you remember? Uh, yes, I played a Candelas guitar. Oh. Candelas uh, had his own guitar shop on 1066 Sunset Boulevard. And he... Uh, it's a funny thing with Candelas. Um, I um, had borrowed one of his guitars and I told him I'd pay him. Actually, a friend of mine by the name of Vera Pere had sent for one of his guitars, and that was my first guitar. You took a liking to it, I guess. I loved it. I think uh, Candelas made some great guitars. Now, the family still has a shop in L.A., and they also have a shop, I think, in Nashville, and they make great guitars, and uh, I, I love their guitars. Now, my guitars are made by Kurt Sand who always has a booth with uh, at the NAM convention uh, promoting the Jose Feliciano guitar. That type of model. See, I gave him an idea. The idea was to make <clears throat> a nylon guitar with a dreadnought 
body. You know, with a body the size of a Martin D28 or that kind of thing. Because most classical guitars are small and the boxes are shallow. They don't have the sound. And when I suggested for him to make the Dreadnought body, I was right on. I was on to something. So once again, that was Robert Cray that we heard first, and then probably a very familiar voice to many of you listening, uh, Jose Feliciano. Seth, what was it like sitting in on that interview? It was a unique experience, to say the least, because, well, like when we were talking about before, like we like to focus on the personality kind of in this. So before I start getting to like the technical stuff, his... um, he he was just a very welcoming guy and like we were talking about how he he wants to know more about you he doesn't like he wants to be relatable so i was like 13 or 14 at the time and just by my voice he could tell i was like that age he was like one year off which mm. is amazing mm. because he can't well he's blind so he can't see me so he can't get a visual like on what my age is he can only just do it by my voice and what i was like talking about and through that he was trying to be relatable he's like okay you like sports like oh what kind of sports you like so i thought that was really interesting that he was just trying to be kind of a welcoming person in this interview yeah i i found him to be so genuine and so relatable and one of the things i remember is while i was setting up the equipment he continued to talk to you and was giving you like fatherly advice you know like (laughs) stay in school and you know that kind of stuff which i thought was really neat that he felt comfortable enough to say that to you. Yeah. And I remember during the interview, like, I was actually kind of confused, like, during the interview because we were all so starstruck when we were with Jose Feliciano. We had no idea what we were going to say. So I remember, um, <clears throat> I think Eric was with us, and he had something written on his hand that he was going to talk about. And he showed, I'm like, what, what is this? And he showed me, I'm like, what the heck is that? I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> and I just wanted to get kind of into this because, you know, I'm like, okay, this is a very important person that we're interviewing. I want to kind of get into this. And and then you had no idea what he was saying either. Like he, it was, I forgot exactly. It was something about a dog or something. And he showed you and you're like, okay. And then he showed me and I'm like, oh, okay. And, but, but that just kind of like the kind of the thing that you feel with Jose Feliciano. Like you kind of just starstruck when you, when you meet him. And he's the person I've talked about the most, like just in my personal life, when I talk about working through interviews, he's the person I talk about the most. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I interviewed Jose Feliciano. You're like, he's a super great guy. And they're like, who's that? I'm like, have you heard Feliciano Navidad? Like, oh, okay, that guy. I'm like, oh, okay. I'm like, see... And then they know immediately. Yeah. 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 That's kind of the thing with the music, like, industry with um, interviewing. Like, when we interview some, like, oh, wow, that person's famous. And then when we ask some guy on the street, he's like, who's that? Like, so that's kind of interesting, though. Like, when you kind of get into the industry, it kind of opens up a new world of people. Yeah, definitely. I mean especially when you start going down rabbit holes of just like, well, this guy was behind the scenes for this guy and Mm. he worked for this guy. And when you're talking to him and you're hearing the stories, it's like, wow, these people are so cool. This is so great. And then you ask anyone on the street and no idea. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Of course, I love that because Mm -hmm. some of this means that these are the underdogs, the people behind the scenes that deserve to be heard. Their stories deserve to be captured and preserved. And that's exactly what NAM allows us to do, which is amazing and quite a blessing. And with Jose, I, what I remember most is just how the whole drive back, Eric, Seth, and I just talked about how what a wonderful experience. So, like, we felt like we had a new friend. <laughs> and that's pretty cool. That's a neat feeling to have. And I do believe that's how he is. You know, it wasn't fake just for us. I think that's just how he is. Yeah, and I remember that, like, people don't really, like, know him, like, that much. Like, they know him, but, like, they don't, like, talk about him every day. But then when you talk about, like, his achievements, they're like, oh, okay, like, I can start to recognize Mm -hmm. kind of who this person is. So, like, Felice Navidad, and then one of my personal favorites is Chico and the Man, (laughs) which is, and um, to all those listeners out there, if you don't know what that is, look it up right now. You won't regret it. (laughs) Yeah, the theme song for that. TV sitcom was awesome. Really, really cool. I listened to it in my own time. Just like no context. I just listened to Chico and the Man. 
That's so funny that you mentioned, you know, people on the street might not necessarily know who a lot of these people are, because I feel like that's my life every day, <laughs> where uh, Dan and Mike might mention, oh, we're going to interview so-and-so, and I'm like, okay, and then I find out who this person is, and I'm like, what? That's crazy! Like, how awesome is that? So... I definitely can relate to those people on the street. (laughs) And it it kind of sparks like an interest in other people, like listeners out there, like maybe I can start doing this for Mm -hmm. myself. And that's really important. I know that's a big part of like NAM and like the oral history program. Right. Well said. Absolutely. So who's up next? It looks like. um... Yeah. Next up is David Gold and Jean Francois Rico. Yes. All right. Very good. Very good. But should we talk just a second about David Gold? Yeah, we can. We okay. can rewind. <laughs> so it's got a <laughs> smile on his face. <laughs> Tell us what you remember about that interview, which took place in his home in Encino, California, as I recall. I, I can talk about this guy for like an hour because this <clears throat> interview was just such like an anomaly when it comes to like what we normally do. Like normally, like okay, I interviewed this guy, it was fun, but like I can kind of live on. But this guy, it was just such an interesting thing because just everything kind of seemed unique. For example, like he he was very protective of his wall and. That's really confusing, but let's get some context on that. It's not just a wall. It's his formula for um, the wall that he made, like a kind of stucco, right? In his recording studio. That made a specific kind of sound that he accredited to that wall. And it's highly unlikely that it's just the wall that did all this. But it's a fun story to kind of have. Like, wow, this is a magic wall that started like this great music, like industry boom kind of thing. And he actually had part of the wall framed (laughs) in his house because like they had to tear it down for some reason. And he had a part of the wall framed and it was like, 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 don't touch that. It's, it's like private. You can't touch it. It's my wall. And, and I thought that was just kind of interesting. Like, sure, like, it's kind of, like, he's kind of being defensive. But, like, it kind of just made you more intrigued. Like, wow, this guy is so unique that he is framing a piece of a wall. Right. I mean, and what's interesting to me, his his perspective was he went around to all these masonaries, remember? And, and people who uh, did carpentry work and, and um, stucco work and things like that to try to figure out the different properties. And he did all kinds of tests with different materials to see what would be the best material for his wall inside his recording studio, which by the way, was Gold Star. For those of you who follow pop music in Los Angeles in the 60s, Mike is smiling. I mean, the hits out of that recording studio are unbelievable, but it would take us an hour to list all the number ones, I think. I mean, it was unbelievable. Uh, Among the things that were recorded there, Phil Spector did his wall of sound. And that's where a lot of that concept of the wall came from is something very special about that acoustic ability in that particular setting. Now, it says, as Seth has pointed out, it wasn't just the wall. You know, it's very likely that the fact that people like the Beach Boys were there <laughs> might have had something to do with it, too. But yes, he was he Mr. Gold was very protective of the formula and would not let even a hint as to what it was other than to say that he felt that the um, construction of that wall had a lot to do with the sound. And he might be right about that. We, we'll probably never know exactly what percentage of that was <laughs> the wall, w- w- which was the, the engineering, amazing engineers that were in that place, the songwriters, the talent, uh, the atmosphere, the magic, you know, all of that has something to do with it, as we know. But uh, for him, number one was the wall. But it helps show him like as a businessman because like he he's showing his um his businessman potential by saying, Hey, look, this wall is magic and this is the reason we're doing this, so it makes people really intrigued mm. and it brings more people and more fame to him. So that's actually an ingenious way that he did that. And sure it probably had partially to do with it, but just kind of the story of a magical wall brings people to the industry. 
Absolutely. What else do you remember about that day? Um, I remember, like, of course, with all these people, I remember their wives <laughs> and just how welcoming they were. And I remember we had cake. And, <laughs> and like I said before, that food is a, a very big part of <laughs> how we do interviews. And they, they served us cake. And I just remember that cake being very good. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So let's hear from David Gold. One of the particular things that I loved was his use of polycylindrical deflectors, and that became my mainstay. I used that in all the studios I built. Mm. Uh, it's used today, you know, in a lot of places, and and I I was successful with it. And I, I just, you know, I would, would any innovation that would, would make sound better interested me. I went to seminars. I did all kinds of things. To me, it was a study in progress, and and it still is today. So uh, we we had the studio built, and uh, we had been using a hallway for an echo chamber. And we would open the door at one end where the studio entrance was, and uh, we would uh, put a microphone at the other end, and that became our echo chamber for a long time until till we till 56 in 56 uh we built the two echo chambers directly behind studio a hmm. and uh i had to come up with something i didn't really we i had i had experimented with all kinds of things springs and and uh, uh Plates, echo plates, and things—they sounded fine for for instruments, but were never good enough for vocals. And so, I remembered something from my youth. My father's shop had a back room, and it had an enormous shower. And I remembered that the shower had some sort of cement on the walls, and it it echoed pretty good. But the problem was I had no idea of what was used. And I did interview some uh, plastering uh, people who worked in that era, who were quite old at the time, right? And they gave me some idea as to what the material was. And uh, I did some research on that, and I actually formulated the surface coat of that material for these echo chambers, which became world known. Uh, I have just one small piece of that chamber left. Uh, I made sure it was destroyed when we closed Gold Star because they were one of a kind. Anyway, so they were a hit. And uh, during the specter age, they became part of the wall of sound. My grandfather said that uh, his life was not to be a performer, but he wanted to compose. And at that time, you know, the best area, best, best town in the world to compose was Paris. So he left his brother and his sister and moved to Paris. When he arrived in Paris, well, to get started, he gave uh, piano lessons, and that's how he met my grandmother, because he was his teacher. And uh, he started composing and was very famous uh, in between 1910 to, uh, to 1940. He wrote many, many valses and serenades that are still being played. And uh, played, uh, had a big form formation, a big orchestra. Played in all the European courts and <coughs> was quite famous. And one day he receives a letter, <coughs> excuse me, he receives a letter from his nephew. His sister married an Italian, of course, by the name of uh, De Michele. And uh, the letter says, uh, Uncle Joe, <coughs> I'm Frankie De Michael, I'm your nephew. I am a clarinet player. I live in Chicago. 
And I have a, an engagement with the Walt Disney Studios in Hollywood to play, to be their clarinetist. But I have a problem. I cannot find good reads. You're in Paris. Can you help me? My grandfather says, sure, no problem. He knew everyone in the music business, of course. And he went to a small factory and bought uh, 100 reeds, sent them to his nephew. And the nephew said, they're great. <coughs> they're not well graded, but I can do it. Please send me more because all my friends are interested. So that continued for about two years. And he was, my grandfather was asking for more and more reeds. Uh, every time the, the, the nephew uh, wrote because there was no fax, no telephone, nothing. You know, it was writing. <coughs> to a point where the, the owner of the manufacturer says, Mr. Rico, uh, I'm sorry, but I won't be able to deliver reads for, to you in such quantities in the future because I cannot find the raw material, the cane to make them. So my grandfather writes to his nephew, and the nephew says, Uncle Joe, you have a villa in the south of France where the cane grows. Why don't you go ahead and buy cane for us, and we will make the reeds. And that's how it started. That's how it started. And in 1928, my grandfather sent the first shipment of cane. All right, welcome back. You just got done hearing Jean-Francois Rico. Uh, I loved this story. Um, again, as that person off the street, I did not know much um, going in. But once I heard the story about how he, how his grandfather got into the business, it was just such an interesting experience. He's definitely one of those people that you, like Seth was saying, you know his accomplishments, mm -hmm. like you know what he's produced, but you don't really know the person until something like this interview program gets to him. Right. right. And then you realize, oh, wow, right. <laughs> this is, he's done a lot. Right. <laughs> yeah, I remember no doubt. asking, I was like, uh, this is one of my first interviews that I helped with. And I was like, hey, Dad, did, is this guy famous? And he's like, to a lot of people, no. But he's like, to people in the industry, yes. And, like, and then that kind of is, like, relatable to, like, what we're doing now. Like, some people are not always, like, considered famous. But then when you, like, really, like, dive into what they've done, like, wow, these people have done a lot. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's really important to kind of go through that. And the major thing about this interview is not even really relating to him. It's relating to something outside the building, which was a statue that lo looked like a poop. Okay. I'm like, <laughs> it looked like a poop. And I, this guy had nothing to do with the statue. I just, that was just such an iconic, um, moment for me though because that was one of my first interviews and it just started a weird conversation about this poop statue <laughs> where it's like <sighs> remember you remember folks he was an eight year old boy so <laughs> yeah. that's what we remember most <laughs> well, and every, so I was sitting down I was listening and then I just saw like there was like um, blinds and I was trying to look through the blinds I'm like what is that thing it looked it didn't look like a statue to me like like a poop statue it didn't look like that it looked like a to me it looked, kind of looked like a nose or something and I was just very intrigued on what that was and then eventually we went out I'm like what is this this is a poop <laughs> like it had a face on it and I don't know it was very odd but that was just a very a memorable moment for me. What I remember is uh, our family was touring in Paris and Seth and I took a long train ride, probably over an hour, to where Mr. Rico was presenting at a very small uh, music educators conference. And we were in a convention center, very, very low key. There wasn't a lot of people there. And we got a whole... A meeting room by ourselves for the interview and I remember Seth being a little restless having been on the train for so long that when I asked him to put on the headphones and listen which he did very carefully he walked all around the room and I there was a couple of times where Mr. Rico and I thought that the headphones were going to come off of his head because he stretched the cord so far wandering all around this big room but I do remember when the microphone came off of Mr. Rico Seth picked up the fact that the sound sounded different and I didn't even notice it fell. I was so engaged in talking to him, I didn't realize it fell on the floor. So Seth interrupted us and said, oh, something's wrong with the sound. So that was great. I probably would not have noticed it. So an another great call from Seth 
and uh, we were able to get a really great interview. I'm really proud of that interview. I mean, as a saxophone guy, I play reeds made by Rico. So it's kind of cool that this is the guy in the family that created this product. So off we go to the next segment, which is one of our favorites. We have two to go, and I think we saved our two favorites to last. So, Seth, tell us about the next guy. Okay, so Smokey Robinson. Um, at the time, I didn't really know who he was. I'm like, okay, he's just some famous singer. Like, he sounds really good. But then, like, in more recent years, I've listened to him more and kind of did some more of my own research. I'm like, wow, this guy is, like, such a big influence. Like, talk about, like, somebody that, like, he actually has the fame and uh, the accomplishments mm-hmm. to go with it. And especially to, like, a kid like me, when I, I was, like, 13 at the time, I'm like, who is this guy? He's just some singer. But then I'm like, wow, he did this. He he pretty much created his own musical movements, like Motown, and like he contributed to like the doo wop phases, which are very influential and some of my personal favorites. So I'm glad that uh, I got to meet him. Yeah, that was really a neat experience. Um, we met him right outside of the um, Del Mar Fair, right? He was yeah. performing, and we got to uh, have tickets to listen to him perform. And then we got backstage passes to go and meet him afterwards. And what I remember about that is um, a little shout out to uh, Earl Bryant, his manager. He got us tickets and waved us in and we felt like kings going through all these other people who were in line before us were like excuse us pardon me coming through and um, we waited for Smokey and um, you know what I'm going to say right when I remember Seth was so happy waiting for Smokey I thought oh my gosh these you know these kids Ella and Jonah were there I thought oh, they're going to lose their patience because we've been kind of waiting a while. I mean, he after the concert, he changes, you know, he relaxes a little bit, and then he comes out and greets people who are there to meet him. And we were waiting a while, but Seth was so happy because there was a soda machine where you could get free soda pops. So he went <laughs> and he was helping himself and happily as he could be walking around waiting for Smokey. But then Smokey came out. What do you remember about that? So, like, the major thing about him was that, like, he was just a great hugger, is what we know <laughs> him as, because he was just so welcoming, and he came over to us, and we all gave him hugs, and I'm like, wow, he's a good hugger, and I told my dad, I'm like, wow, he, like, he, this is good, like, he's a good hugger, he's a nice guy, and he was just so um, welcoming, and we were talking about how, like, a- as guys, we know that he's, like, a good-looking guy, and we're like, wow, and we're like, and we're like wow, I don't know what this is, but, like, like he... Like, he's just a really welcoming and nice person to be around. His piercing blue eyes is what I remember. I mean, what, I'm like, oh, I like this guy. He's, you know, he was so nice and very friendly. He took his time with everybody, which I thought was really neat. Yeah, just a, a really neat guy. And we got to meet members. Remember Savon, the, the keyboardist, came over. We got to talk to him and other yeah, members yeah. of the band. That was really, really a neat experience. Wow, don't you wish all interviews were like that? Oh Free gosh. soda, I know, right? nice hugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're not all like that. No. <laughs> well, that wasn't even really part of the interview. I don't think I actually got to be part of the interview. No, you're right. But... That took place later Yeah, at the NAMM show, and you weren't there for the interview. But the, we wanted to include this just because of that great story of meeting him. Well, it shows like the personality of him. Like He's not just a good interviewee. He's a, just a generally good guy. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah, amazing talent. So let's hear from Smokey's interview, and then we're going to come back and play our very last clip. Well, music means everything to me, of course, because it's been my life, and it was my life before it was my life. I have loved music all of my life. And fortunately, like I say all the time, I grew up in a home where there was always music. And I'm very happy about that because, you know, it, 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 it set me along the way of of. of, uh, of finding a love that I loved that would be a lifetime love. And um, so it, it means everything to me. You know, I, 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 I earn my living making music and being involved in music. So it's, it's my livelihood, but I've done it for free. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so I've done it just for the opportunity to go somewhere and sing. And uh, th- that's love. That's the kind of love that I think you have to have to sustain yourself and to, to, to maintain 
a, a musical career. You've got to love it because there's so many no's. You know, um, if you're a person who can't accept a no or who can't get knocked down and get back up, then don't pursue music because there are so many no's. There are so many, well, rejections and, well, we're sorry's, you know. But um, if, if you can withstand those and, and, and endure, um, then you have a chance to do music as your life. But you got to love it. You know, one of my favorite songwriters next to you is Irving Berlin, and I really Mine too. Really? Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> you have a favorite lyric or song of his? Uh, I, I think that uh, "Our Love Is Here to Stay" mm. is uh, is uh, one of my favorite songs ever. Um, was that the Gershwins or was that, that was Gershwin? That yeah. was the Gershwins. That was the Gershwins. Anything of Irving Berlin, but I, I do. I like always. And yeah, 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 yeah. He, yeah. he, Irving Berlin. Um, I grew up listening to his music. Um, because my, I had two older sisters, and that's the kind of music they played. See, mm. I, my first introduction to music, the first voice I ever remember hearing in my life was Sarah Vaughan. And uh, that kind of music uh, was my first inkling. Mm. And uh, that and gospel. My mom played gospel, and she, my mom also played the blues. My mom loved the blues. Uh, Muddy Waters and John Lee Hooker and people like that, you know. So, uh, but uh, Irving Berlin's music was in our house all the time. The uh, Corn, Irving Berlin, the Gershwins, and all, all the people. Uh, because I, I, I grew up at a time when the song was king, you see. Um, it, it, it reverted along the way somewhere where the artist became the focal point. But I grew up at a time when the song was king, you see. And when somebody wrote a hit song, everybody recorded it. That's why when you listen to this, it's the, the, the old American songbook. I call it standards, you know. Uh, when you hear one of those songs, you've heard it by everybody. You've heard it by everybody because everybody jumped on that song. That's right. And uh, they're going to record that song, so the song was king. And um, so I heard a lot of Irving Berlin's music all the time. I love that line that Jerome Curran said about Berlin. He said he was blessed with every man's ear and heart. And that's sort of how I feel about you. You know, you could say something that we all are listening say, oh, I wish I knew how to say it like that. You know, I wish I could express it that same way because that's how I feel. Well, man, uh, for you to put me in that same breath with Irving Berlin <laughs> is, <laughs> is incredible to me. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. But, uh, but uh, I, you know, I, I always want to try to say something differently if I, if I can. If I can say it differently than it's been said, then I want to. I really appreciate your time. This is fantastic. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. I appreciate you. So once again, that was Smokey Robinson. And we're moving on to our final clip, um, which I know has a pretty big significance for both Dan and Seth. Um, and that is Whispering Bill Anderson. This is another one where Seth wasn't actually there for the interview. This took place in Nashville during an AM show uh, one summer. Um, but Seth would get up early in the morning um, before school and we would watch the game show network. And I think about 6.30 in the morning while breakfast was being made, um, the um, match game would come on, the old reruns from the 70s. And Whispering Bill was a contestant. He sat in the, t the top row, as I recall. And so when I had a chance to interview him, I asked him, would you please record a little message for my son because he loved watching you on television? And that's the clip that we're going to play. So tell us what you remember about that. Well, so like I, I never met him, but just having him as like a fairly famous person I've seen on TV talk to me directly. I'm like, wow, this is a good, like a good moment. And I remember the, the CD that you guys made for me <laughs> was, um, a, a really fun moment too because it had like a banana split on it and it was called like says like goodness or something like that <laughs> and it was just really fun to have someone like sure I didn't really know his accomplishments but like wow this guy's on TV and this guy is talking directly to me through like my dad was so kind to do this like I thought that was just such a great moment and it's just kind of a fun thing to look back on like this guy would go out of his way just to re record a little saying for this guy's son like I thought that was really nice and the fact that he's just really warmed up I mean I love that he's like hey buddy Seth you know yeah. I mean it was so endearing and 
I liked them before, but I love them afterwards. I mean, that's exactly how I feel about it. So let's play this. And a special shout out to Mike, who had to go through the interview and find this outtake. Appreciate you doing that. South, it was a lot of fun, uh, buddy. I knew very little about it when they started asking me to come to California and be on the game shows. But it was a wonderful experience. I met a lot of wonderful, wonderful people. If you like Match Game, I got to be friends with Gene Rayburn and Richard Dawson and Charles Nelson Ryan and Brett Summers and the people on that show. I wouldn't take anything for those friendships. I got to know Betty White and Alan Ludden and people like that uh, from my days on Password. It was a long way removed from the country music business, but uh, as a person, as an entertainer, uh, as a communicator, whatever, I learned so much from just being around those people. I was just like a sponge soaking it all up, uh, and uh, it was it was really a lot of fun. I'm so glad that I got to do it, and, and I'm glad you like to wake up in the morning and watch it. So that's our, our last clip today. I just want to say how much I'm so proud to have my son Seth here. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here for this special, special podcast. No, I had a lot of fun. And I, I think it's good for the listeners out there to kind of get a new perspective. And I think it's just a lot of fun. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll see you again in two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye.